Uh, Paul Frenzen studied ancient history and provincial Roman archaeology at the University of Nijmegen in the Netherlands. And he's worked in Nijmegen for 12 years at the Department of Provincial Roman Archaeology. Uh, I've translated that into English since my Dutch is, is terrible. Um, and in his job, he's responsible for excavations at the legionary fortress of Nijmegen and the military town outside the, the Cannabi Legionis at various Roman forts in their extramural settlements, for example, at, at Verden and uh, Zwammerdam and Elfenland der Rhein, as well as at the Roman forts of Tau and Romita in uh, Romania. And after a few years as a manager at one of the largest commercial excavation firms in the Netherlands, he became the regional archaeologist, which uh, I'm going to butcher the Dutch here, uh, Regio Archeologue, maybe is how it's pronounced, uh, for eight different communities around uh, the city of Nijmegen, uh, which is similar to what we have in the UK as a county archaeologist. And since 2013, he's been the um, senior Belled advisor, advisor archaeology at the city of Nijmegen. Um, and that is a job that combines kind of uh, involvement in, in management of policy and advising on policy and planning uh, in the office of planning that we would have here in the UK. So with that, I will ask Paul to please take it away. Start, start our journey up the Rhine. Um, hello from Nijmegen. Um, I hope I'm audible to anyone and all. Um, when Rob asked me to do a presentation on Germania Inferior, well, <clears throat> it started out as uh, the Lower uh, Rhine, which in both the Dutch and German language means something, well, a bit different. And I thought, okay, why not the entire province? Big mistake. Um, because there is too much, even for actually a rather small province. Okay, very brief. Um, now we have to, yeah. Uh, Germania Inferior province established around 83-85 AD and I think you could call it a very military province or command and it had its peak or heyday on the military side uh, around 100 AD. It borders on Germania Superior, um, Germania Belgica, the North Sea Coast and of course those, well, barbarian lands to the north. Capital is Cologne. Cologne, and I hope all the facts are uh, visible to you, um, one of the major cities ever since the Roman times into the Middle Ages, and even until now in the northwest of Europe, uh, present population one million plus, um, and it all started under Augustus. Uh, founded either in 37 or 19 BC, and it had everything to do with the resettling of a Germanic tribe, the Ubi, to our side of the Rhine. Um, well, you can read all the facts there. It had legions, a naval base up until the end. It got elevated to a colonia in 50 AD, and it is and was a huge city, even in Roman times. It's a combination, I think, of Colchester and London, both at, it, at its height and, and a bit plus. Um, possible uh, number of inhabitants, uh, around 40,000, although other people uh, claim 25,000 is already a fair number. Um, 98 hectares large, and as you see, it has everything and more. One of the interesting things is uh, the Ara Ubiurum, an altar to the Ubi, uh, the cult of Roma at Augusta, which of course had its parallel um, in Gaul, in Lyon. Roman coins, Roma et Augusta, that's the cult, the emperor, the gods, and that in Cologne. Cologne was of course destined to become the capital of entire the German provinces or province. Good. About everything you see on the left side um, can be a topic of quite long discussions. The exact date of the uh, establishing, um, did it really peak around 100? And especially those borders. Um, something very unclear is whether or not, and that's the question mark in the middle of the map, the uh, tribal area of the Tungri, 
belongs either to Germania Inferior or Gallia Belgica. Um, the debate is still out. There is no proof either way, and so also no way of disproving it yet. Do find me an inscription that clears all. Anyway, um, you see the location and a bit of landscaping. And this is the situation around 100 AD. The red squares, the large ones, are the locations where legions are located. I hope you see this. Nijmegen, Xanten, Neuss, Bonn, the capital, of course, here. And a military diploma, which very conveniently lists all the auxiliary units at that time in the province. So we know there should be six alle and 25 cohorts, somewhere divided over all those small red squares along the frontier. And yes, it doesn't match. Um, talking about Romans is talking about models, I think. Um, what I'm showing you here is the topography of several legionary fortresses all around the northwestern borders. Top left, Nijmegen, then Vetra, Oxanten 1, Oxanten 2, then bottom row left, um, Bonn, then Canuntum, which is to the northeast of uh, Vienna, Vindobona, and bottom right is Aquincum, modern day Budapest. What you see is the presence, they're all located on a river. The core is number one in red, a fortress. There is surrounding that fortress, uh, a military town, the Canabe Legionis. And at a certain distance, actually one loige, uh, about two and a half kilometers away, is a major civilian settlement, which mostly doubles as a Kivitas uh, capital. This is a model all along the Danube, the Rhine, and if you look at Kalian, Chester, etc., you will recognize this is probably what the Romans did when they came looking for a location where to uh, settle and get their legions on the ground. It is not only um, within those settlements, those combined settlements, uh, that we um, have the Romans working on a model, as we see later on. Um, one thing more, yes, of course, size, size matters. Uh, the average legionary fortress uh, is about 22, 24 hectares. Bonn, for instance, is 27.8 hectares, which is fairly large. Uh, Nijmegen has 18 hectares, which is a bit undersized. Um, the Canabe, or military town, can become huge. Um, in Nijmegen, we estimate it's about 100 hectares. Um, Canuntum and Aquincum in the east um, have been much better researched, and they are well over 250 hectares at the moment, tendency growing. So they're, they're huge. And for instance, in Nijmegen, the Municipium, the Opium of Jomarcus Patavorum, was only about 40 hectares. 100 hectares for the Colonia. We just saw how large uh, Cologne was. And this is also the case for the Colonia at uh, Xanten. Together, this makes one hell of a strip, urbanized urban strip of buildings and people. Good. Planning. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that the Romans modeled, like I said before, this is just your average uh, play card Roman fortress, roads leading in and two, and on the top distances in meters. And we're going to have a look, a quick look at some of the uh, larger buildings we find in the military term. And well, what shall I say? Let's have a look. It's about the uh, amphitheaters we find there and the forum or other interpretation, um, uh, the campus, uh, the exercise uh, halls or multi-purpose military um, building. 
and they are huge. Good. Leon in Spain, we only know the amphitheater. Chester, got an amphitheater as well. Kalian, Nijmegen, we know both buildings. Vetra 1, Mirabeau, which is in France, in the neighborhood of Strasbourg. Vindonissa in Switzerland. Um, in Vindonissa, the problem is we don't know which is front and back at the fortress. So both options are uh, shown. Canuntum, as stated. Bregetio, which is just across the Hungarian border. Aquincum, Budapest. And as you may have noticed, most of these buildings are in fairly the same locations. Um, and back to the point I wanted to make, if you see one, you've seen them all. Not really, of course, but on a large scale with a, a view, a top view, bird's eye view, yes, it does. Um, of course, the sport is looking for the differences, um, which makes a legionary fortress usually comes with a military town, with a civilian town in the neighborhood. If you've got one, start looking for all the other elements mm -hmm. there should be. Um, and the contrast with what we have here and in Nijmegen, for instance, is a uh, front of about four and a half, five kilometers and one kilometer deep of urban buildings, uh, two, three, four stories high, like you see uh, top bottom, uh, bottom right, I should say, um, which is a look inside the forum at Nijmegen. Um, that's the scale of buildings, including the fortress. And the contrast as said in with pre-Roman times must have been enormous, but also with the Roman countryside. One question I can't answer quite well, maybe, maybe not. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, especially, we are not sure whether or not we always see military figures. And in the Dutch part, the location of the fort was made uh, usually also the location of later uh, medieval, uh, well, modern towns, um, with a tendency to build the main church on top of either the Principia or the uh, false bath building, which makes research quite difficult. Um, also, the river um, ate or destroyed quite a lot of the forts, we think. And now comes the research bias. Usually, in the olden times, research was focused merely on the forts. What happened to the Viki, we don't know always. Um, partly to do with that finding stone build structures is easier than timber, wattle and dolp constructions. And in the German part of uh, Germania and Fierio, um, there were just less uh, excavations. The number, well, they've got more space. They don't need to build on top of their own things. Sometimes they do, but they don't have to always, like we do. Um, on the other hand, they are now much more active with uh, geophys, which gives us reason, well, great results, new insights. Do invite the German colleagues. Um, there are differences there, um, and especially what you would call uh, the normal forts elsewhere uh, in Germany, but also in other provinces, including Britannia. And um, quite a lot of the Dutch uh, forts, which we call the Delta type forts, and we'll come to that later. Good. Contrast with the uh, countryside, this is um, actually a fairly typical uh, Batavian settlement, uh, which can model for, I think, the hundreds, question mark, we never counted them, um, within the entire province. And living like this would be the norm for most people. And the, uh, depicted are three phases. Uh, and what you should or could notice is that the number of uh, houses and families with them who are contemporary is fairly low, two, three, sometimes four. Um, the largest we think we have now in the Netherlands at least has six, maybe seven contemporary houses. So the villages or hamlets maybe, um, settlements maybe the better word, 
in the countryside are fairly small and they have structures um well to us they're normal long houses i think i guess britain only experiences when the saxons come um and migrate to britain contrast urban countryside the countryside shown here till Passway is on our side of the uh, limes is not much different uh, at that time from across the border so coming to romanized nijmegen or especially cologne and you will be stunned good that was the situation about 100 ad now we're going to 150 ad and things change if you manage to count all the small dots on the map before, there are quite a few less now. The Legion in Nijmegen and Neuss have gone. Uh, the one from Neuss has gone actually to Britain. And the one from Nijmegen has left for the Dacian walls. At first uh, Budapest and later coming back and being stationed in Vienna and staying there well into the fourth and I think early fifth century even. So we are left with two and notably quite a few less uh, of the auxiliary units the number of alley has dropped to four and we've got only 15 cohorts left which means in about 50 years we lost nearly half the army on the other hand and contrary to what you might think settlements in the countryside start to flourish and villa as well We've got a villa um, concentration, especially west of Cologne, and the Aldenhof Platte. Um, I'm not well. I can show you where, more or less, this region, where there's an enormous uh, brown coal uh, mining, coal mining, open air, uh, with huge, um, uh, well, holes in the ground, hundreds of meters deep. Um, there was a, quite a lot of research uh, before the mining could start, which yielded a lot of data on Ville, etc. And the picture we get from that area, but also from the area what we call in the Netherlands the Betuwe, which is the north or to the north and northwest of Nijmegen, is that about every two and a half kilometers um, there is one form or, of a settlement at its heyday. So. It's, it's much like modern days, well, here. You couldn't stand somewhere and see not a village nearly, which means they were doing well. It's agriculture, it's Roman imports coming in. And despite the army having left, uh, well, half of them, economy is doing fine. The towns are booming um, and settlements get imports and get Romanized more and more. Just a step back from that thing. Um, Roman influence on the countryside started uh, in Tiberian times, even perhaps already in Augustan times, but quite clearly in uh, Tiberian times. And what you see at first is uh, they take the, the Roman pottery comes in. Um, not in the quantities we see later, and this makes uh, archaeology quite um, easy on one side, because you've got a quite distinctive um, correlations between types of pottery and the quantity of metal in a military context, and quite different um, combinations in the well rural settlements. Good. Later, they grow to uh, more coming together. Wealth is spreading. Good. Um, as stated, we also have a villa in the Nijmegen neighborhood, the tiny village of Plasmolen, which overlooks the Meuse Valley, is 15 kilometers to, uh, kilometers to the south of Nijmegen. And the villa, the main building you see reconstructed here, has a front of just over 100 meters. I personally <clears throat> live quite more small lot than that. Um, so we got one hand, the civilian part of the province is flourishing, it seems, and the military side has left us partly.
Good. The Pax Romana is actually a most boring period because hardly anything happens while well, it's peace and that's good for people. Yet, um, and that's on the left, uh, the history of the province by certain key dates, uh, of course, the Batavian Civil War and Civil War in 69-70. We became a province in 85. In 98, actually already, Trajan was both governor and became emperor. Uh, he was governor of both Germania Superior and Inferior. Well, and the rest more or less stated already, but some key dates which um, pop up every now and then in Dutch archaeology. Um, major construction works on uh, mainly the Lemus Road around 120. Uh, 160 sees both uh, work on forts. Uh, some of them get for the first time uh, stone constructions. It's all been wood before them and also works on the Lemus Road. And then problems start for the empire, but not here. The Marco Mani and the invasions, it's somewhere else. Yeah. Living in Germania Inferior means you don't notice, not really. Then in 173, pirates attack parts of Gallia Belgica coming from the sea. Actually, we don't see it much, or we don't think, or we used to think, but actually, there are no destruction layers, nothing which gets a clear um, indications that uh, towns or uh, villages were destroyed by pirates or whatever. Yet we see somewhere between 160 and 180 the beginning of coastal defences, which is actually, um, well, the precursor uh, of what you would like to call the Saxon fort uh, shore defences. And somewhere after 175, for instance, for the first time, the uh, city of Nijmegen, Opianovi Marcus Batavorum, gets a defensive wall and ditch. It hadn't before. What we also see is severe and reconstruction work at the end of the second century, and we have near identical inscriptions testifying to that from the forts of Leiden, Gronburg, and Alphen and Rijn, coming up later. As stated, what we don't see in the archaeological record, and this is a German word, Limesfall uh, of 2060, um, which means actually the fall of the Limes, the border, frontier zone, I stated no uh, destruction, but what we do start to see is a general decline. At the end of the second century, continues with some hiccups and local differences well into the third century. And mainly it means for us archaeologists, uh, uh, at least less finds, there's less coinage going on, that, uh, there's some other imports coming in and the routes, uh, how do these imports get to us, change. And settlements shrink or even disappear. So the heyday of the second century gradually declines and declines. Possible causes, and this is a lot of discussion in Dutch archaeology, um, German and French archaeology, uh, the reasons why. Um, options are climate change. Uh, we had a fairly mild climate when the Romans came, but now it gets colder and which means crops uh, become difficult. Uh, groundwater levels uh, are rising, which means it gets even more wet than it was before. And in the heyday, marginal soils, uh, soils were taken into um, production, but they get exhausted. And well, yeah. Then there's the first of the plagues around in the 250s. And of course, the internal strife and I don't know whether or not anyone read the book, Adrian Goldsworth about the end of the West. Um, he makes some fairly good points. What happens then? Yes, we do have the period of Gallic Empire, 260 to 75, four, civil wars mainly elsewhere, yet we feel the indirect consequences. For instance, poor economy, inflation, um, and uh, very uh, interesting and important to notice, an interrupted money supply. Also, and this might be us scientists, uh, we have dating problems. <clears throat> For instance, you should never ever date something on coins solely. 
And one of the key uh, assemblages which was used to date a lot of forts and fortresses and uh, events, uh, the, the pottery etc. from the fort of Niederbiber, those dates turned out to be wrong. A part starts earlier, <laughs> and, uh, a large part goes on well into the third century and some even perhaps in the fourth century. So a lot of our dating is problematic and also assumption upon assumption. Then there's the question of the depopulation, whether it's voluntarily or not, we don't know. What we do see is the Franks coming in and some places like Nijmegen, they see a building or rebuilding phase around 300. For instance, Nijmegen gets a new fort at the Volkhof, which is in the center of the modern town. Reconstructing work um, is a nice uh, point uh, where we return to the nice parts of archaeology. Uh, this is a Roman road, um, the casing actually of it. There used to be uh, uh, layers of gravel on top of this. It functions partially as a dike, uh, but not always. And these are reconstructions or construction works probably carried out in 160 or later. And they were found in 2018, so only three years ago, um, near Valkenburg. And Valkenburg is one of the fortress, or forts, I should say, uh, very close to the coast. And quite conveniently, a few of those timber uh, posts were stamped on bottom right, cohorts to Kivium Romanorum, or the second cohorts of Roman citizens, which it's quite nice for them to let us know who did this. They must have been proud. Another rebuilding uh, phase, uh, this time from Alphen am Rhein, but with, as I stated before, a near identical inscription coming from Leiden Roenberg. Uh, a few slabs we found in 1998. Um, and a few years later, we got the chance to excavate the area next to it and found some more stones. And now you see what reconstructing an inscription can do. Um, and this is Septimius Severus Pertinax Augustus Aliabenicus uh, Perticus uh, Maximus. Then most important, he is Imperator for the 11th time, Pater Patriae, Proconsul, and his first son is named Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, the later Caracalla, he is consul for the third time, proconsul, probably the second son is named as well. And why is this inscription here? Because the gates were reconstructed. Courante means by, um, in this case, some officer or, and the EO letters are probably the name of a governor at that time. Given all the titles, this um, inscription dates between two or four, 204 and 211, his death in York. And now we've got a link with England, or Britain to be more precise. Um, Delta type forts I mentioned. This is how a usual a normal Roman fort looks like. A fort is for an auxiliary unit, fortress that contains a legion, um, and what we see is in the rear a zone, a middle zone with large buildings, the headquarters, and a zone to the front. In this case, the front is bottom. This is for a double unit, this is for a singular unit, but we see one part, middle part, front part. So three parts. And please do note that the front side is smaller than the sides. And now we go to the Netherlands. This is Valkenburg in five, six of its main phases, which starts actually in the year 40, winter 39, 40, the first timbers are uh, felled and it goes well into the uh, third century when it's rebuilt or built in stone. It hardly changes shape. The headquarter is in the rear. There is, an entire section actually missing 
compared to the normal ones. And this is in every single phase the case. And also note that front side tends to be longer than the sides. So a bit, a bit of a mix up. This type we find at Valkenburg, at Leiden Romburg, Alphen aan de Rijn, Zwammerdam, Bodegraven, Woerden, Hogewood, Utrecht, and Mijnerswijk, and probably at a few other locations as well. One variation is the fort at Vechtem, which does have the three zones, the front, the middle zone, and the rear. Yet here too, the front is longer than the sides. Strange people, those Romans. Good. Well, are all these places? Falkenburg is here, and all those forts mentioned are here. This is Vechtem. And just to know where we are, here is Nijmegen. This purple color or pink on my screen indicates peat, bogs, moors, wet, yiri. This means that you can't easily travel here. You shouldn't be living here either way. And it restricts living conditions and agriculture and your forts actually to these zones, riverine zones. If it weren't for the fact that these also are flood plains, and only here where you see these, well, we call them mountains, um, and here, and this part here, these are areas which are definitely high and dry. So living in the Netherlands in the year 100 or 200, is quite problematic if you don't like swimming or drowning. Good. Back to Valkenburg, which has been nominated for and awarded uh, UNESCO World Heritage status. This is what is in the file. Uh, you see um, the river to the right, the fort in its typical form, a civilian settlement around it, and some trenches here and there. These orange things indicate the graves, the cemeteries, quite normal until, well, nearly until. Um, this is a very nice uh, bird's eye view, reconstruction. We see the fort, headquarters, harbor facilities, the first uh, set of housing, then an open space. And in the back, we see another housing or village or vacuous like structure, which we didn't quite understood why they were so divided and apart from each other. The North Sea is in the back, in our backs, so we're looking inward. And then it turned out that we just looked from top to the bottom. This is the Castellum, the fort. And we discovered, well, we, my colleagues uh, who work there, uh, discovered uh, an entire Roman fortress, which measures about 440 by 440 meters, which is large enough for an entire legion. And it has proper structures, as we will see. And also note that what turned out to be this site, if we go back one thing, was here reconstructed as the road. And it turned out it's part of the defensive works of a fortress. This is um, a picture made by a drone. So we're looking down the foundations in wood with here, 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 and here. Posts for uh, a watchtower. And from left to right, the wall would continue. Top left how a Dutch excavation in the clay looks like and how it looks like after it rained a bit. Um, the entire complex is dendro dated uh, in the year late 39, early 40, which of course coincides with the first attempts of the Romans after Caesar to invade Britain again. He was on the coast. He never dared or made the move and it was his successor. Claudius, which did. 
added evidence, a stemmed wine barrel, and this stamp has been found on uh, wine barrels found both at Valkenburg, the fort, which we saw before, in the 1940s, and at, fort, uh, at the fort at Vechten. And it does say in the top line, Gaius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, his official name, and we know him by name as Caligula, but that is his signature. Good. Another connection with Britain, therefore. Rob, how am I doing time-wise? Anyway. You're okay. Uh, you've got about five more minutes. That feasible. Okay. Then I've got some slides extra. Um, because I started with us being or becoming a province. But there is, of course, a time before that. Um, how did we get here? Well, how did we get here is the most obvious route by land. On the bottom, Rome, and here in the south, a small delta with Massilia, originated as um, a Greek colony, then became Rome, Roman, and then the capital of all the Gauls, Lyon, and you see the valleys here, the rivers, across over here, then to the Rhine, and then small part here through, and then it opens up. And hello, Bonn, Köln, Neuss, Xanten, Nijmegen, and Falkenburg, and the rest. This is the most, um, well, accessible, available land route. The other route, um, if you wanted to, or had to, was in the south, crossing here, and then going by sea, or by land, but then still a lot of rivers to cross. And of course, the Bay of Biscay and this part is not known for its uh, calm weather. So the most likable or likely route would have been this one, which the Romans demonstrated conveniently for us. When they came to Nijmegen as the first um, uh, proper settling uh, location in the Netherlands or in Germania Inferior in Tar, they settled in Nijmegen at the Hunerberg and they brought with them coins and they lost them. And a colleague of ours, uh, now a professor in Germany, Fleur Kemmers, um, she analyzed it and she could reconstruct the entire route from northern Italy going through all these Gaul areas with all kinds of tribes with their own coinage and depositing them there. There being this 42 hectare large settlement or base dated between 19 and 16 until 12 BC. Bird's view and in right mark the interior of the fort rests or base, the river at that time probably. A view in the inside where we see very clear uh, structures here, heads of uh, barracks with the centurion's quarters, another set here, a very clearly marked here, a gate in the center, very, very large buildings, uh, high status buildings, um, officer quarters, probably the tribunes, the the well-to-do. Uh, these are probably um, also officers' uh, quarters, and maybe we see here the start of the Principia, the formal headquarters. Um, here, a smaller set of barracks, probably auxiliary units, and these then being leisurely units. Two uh, ditches, and at regular intervals, towers, and they go all the way. These actually are dates from an excavation we did with the university. A reconstruction we made a few years ago when SketchUp was still free and, well, gave us an insight in how it might have looked like this. And as you see, you plot the excavation uh, drawings underneath and erase them and reconstruct them into buildings like this. Good. One of the things of um, studying an entire province divided by two countries is that 
most research is carried out until the border and not further. Um, and you've got different traditions in how to conduct your research, which means it's a hell of a job to get those two together. On the right, uh, you see the German um, or results of German research in how the river, the Rhine, developed and moved in Roman times in their part of the Lower Rhine area. And as I may have stated before, this river is not static. It changes uh, its channels, its course, and can do so in fairly short time, actually. In one, two seasons, year, it can move hundreds of meters. So saying the river is the border means, well, somewhere in the neighborhood of is probably the border. On the left, um, and it's a map I chose uh, on purpose, in red are the inaccessible parts of the landscape. It's the basis of the map we saw early on, uh, poorly accessible in orange, which makes here, here, but also on the north, some inroads, moderately accessible. Well, at a point you're uh, um, glad with anything, is yellow, which we see in certain parts here. Here it's getting better. Reasonably accessible, the light greens, and accessible, the dark greens. This was not a land to love at that time. It was wet, it had peatlands, bogs, miles, moors, floodplains, tidal zones, and barbarians. Good. This combined uh, makes that what looked uh, from the maps previously, and I'll go a few back. If you think that these mountainous areas are the problem, and hooray, we're now in open space country and all is well, au contraire. This is not easy country to live in, to travel, to fight or whatever. The first Romans arrived, as we saw in Nijmegen, then a, year, a few years later, the first fortress at uh, Neuss and Xanten, 16 and 15 BC, uh, established and from there on uh, quite a lot of campaigns uh, went east in conquering the rest of the German province, would-be province, uh, partially uh, uh, along the route of the Lipper River. Well, the valley, quite a number of Roman forts, fortresses, um, also by sea, amphibious landings on the coast, resupplying, uh, landing troops, it's got it all. This is the Weser River, the Elbe River, and at least many a time they reached here and apparently now and then even there. So at first things seemed to go well and then it turned a bit nasty as I wrote here. And then it got a bit better, but it never <laughs> went uh, as uh, hoped for in the beginning. I think you all know this place called Krisen. 9 AD, and the famous mask found there. In the year 6 AD, the Romans had 11 legions in Germania to complete the conquest. And then in 6 AD, a revolt started in Illyria, here. And it crossed over into Pannonia, just off the map. And it took three years to subdue that, and it, they had to transfer eight from the 11 legions uh, from Germany to do so. And in fact, they needed 10 to 15 legions, 70 auxiliary corps, and no less than 15 Ale in three years of bitter fighting to quell that rebellion. And by that time, we are in 9 AD. And in 9 AD, Varus is, has only left, or had been left with three legions and he manages to lose them. Um, there's a bit of revenge going on. Uh, other generals afterwards um, have punitive strikes. Part of the country is reconquered by, well, on and off. But every time something uh, pops up elsewhere. Um, last week, Professor Hansen uh, stated 
for the situation in Britain, that the same actually applied there. Uh, whenever the, uh, the Romans are busy with something, something somewhere else pops up and they have to divide their forces, their attention, their resources, and things never get, well, you never get maximum effort for what you could do. In 47, Claudius, after his conquest uh, of Britain, has had enough. And at that time, he has a famous general, one of the better ones, Corbulo, Gnaeus Domitius Corbulo, who, um, very energetic, is busy reconquering large tracts of Germany, starting in the north of the Netherlands. And Claudius realizes, I don't want it. And he um, orders him to refer, fall back on which means falling back on existing positions along the Rhine. And that is the moment the Rhine River becomes the frontier, the Lemus in this part. And hooray, we've got a northern border for our province. There's a civil war at the end of uh, uh, six, or oh, in the June 68, uh, Nero uh, commits suicide. There's a revolt going on. Uh, one after the other, uh, general or governor tries to become emperor. We've got the year of the four emperors, 69, 70 AD. There is a large revolt of the Batavians who started out on the side of the Flavians. Um, but then it grew larger and larger. They conquered quite a lot of territory. And it took the Romans eight legions and a lot of uh, power to subdue them again. And where you might have thought, well, that's the end of the Batavians, actually, nothing changed. Not really. The Batavians continued to serve in the Roman army. Their lands were not burned down. Um, actually, they were still best friends, it seems, afterwards. Um, quite unusual. And a few years later, we got, of course, Bray, we become a province. And from that time on, the local uh, field commander uh, got another title, which is Legatus Agusti Pro Pretore, which means um, the personal um, legate or representative of the Augusto, uh, Augustus, the, the, well, the emperor. And Pro Pretore gives his status on the consular career uh, path. He is a top Roman. Good. I think this was the last one. Rob? Thank you very much, Paul. And Jennifer Schumper joins us uh, as the site manager of the World Heritage Site of the Lower German Limes and Upper German Ration Limes, which is in the Rhineland Palatinate and uh, is part of the Directorate General for Cultural Heritage in the Rhineland Palatinate which is itself part of the Directorate for State Archaeology uh, in Germany. So that's a bit of a mouthful. I had to read that, so I didn't get the technicalities wrong. Uh, I think perhaps the more important and interesting bit, of course, is that uh, Jenny's interests include Roman military equipment and, of course, the limes, which are the best research interests to have and ones that everyone should have, um, which is why most of you are here today. So with that in mind, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Jenny and take it away. Uh, thank you very much. So I think you can all hear me loud and clear. Okay, excellent. So first of all, I would like to thank you, Rob, and everyone involved for inviting me to speak here. In the next 20 minutes, I would like to follow up on the presentation uh, by my previous speaker, Paul, and tell you something about the Rhine as a Roman frontier. But I will only briefly touch on the Lower German Limes, as we have just been informed about it in detail. But before I start with the Roman frontier, I would like to give you some brief information about the River Rhine itself. Um, the Rhine rises in the Swiss Alps, flows through Lake Constance, bends north at Basel, forms the border with France, then um, meanders through Germany and flows into the North Sea in the Netherlands. The Rhine is um, 1,232.7 kilometers long and is divided into seven sections, as you can see on the slide. Uh, my lecture deals with the 130 kilometers long Middle Rhine. Um, 
67 kilometers of which belong to the UNESCO World Heritage Site Upper Middle Rhine Valley and 20 kilometers belong to the new inscribed World Heritage Site, uh, the Lower German Lemurs, Frontiers of the Roman Empire. Um, here you can see a topographic map of the Middle Rhine and the Lower Rhine. Um, the foothills of the Rhenish Massif, as you can see here in the, in the south, um, and the transition to the Cologne and Lower Rhine Bays are clearly visible. So you can see here you have the mountain ranges and here you have the, the lower, um, the lower bays um, to the North Sea. This slide shows you the 130 kilometers long Middle Rhine between Bonn in the north here and Bingen in the south. And the river cuts deeply into the low mountain ranges to the left and right, as you can see on this slide here. This is um, Koblenz, where the Mosel flows into the River Rhine. And um, here you've got Bonn, Remagen, which is the last uh, fort on the lower German lemurs coming from the north. The Middle Rhine Valley itself is a 130 kilometer long section of the Rhine between Bingen and uh, the mouth of the river uh, Sieg, north of Bonn. And for the entire length, the river forms a breakthrough valley through the Rhenish Massif or the so-called Rhenish Slate Mountains. Uh, therefore, the Middle Rhine Valley has always been one of the most important traffic routes between northern and southern Germany. Since Roman times, there has also been a constant exchange between the Mediterranean region and Northern Europe via the Middle Rhine Valley. The Romans settled the area from the middle of the first century BC. Uh, Caesar first crossed the river in uh, 55 BC near Neuwied, uh, which is a few kilometers north of Koblenz, um, until about 450 AD. All right, after, um, so after this short introduction on the geography and the uh, topography of the area, I would uh, like, I would now like to come to the actual topic of this lecture, the Rhine as a Roman frontier with a focus on the Middle Rhine Valley. Um, unlike the Lower Rhine or uh, the, the province Germania Inferior, the frontier situation on the Middle Rhine in, in Germania Superior is more dynamic. Um, already Caesar and also Augustus, as we, as we already heard, wanted to extend the Roman Empire to the territories beyond the Rhine. However, this plan was abandoned with a devastating defeat at the Battle of Varus in 9 AD. So the Romans decided to retreat uh, to the Rhine. Under Emperor Claudius, the first continuous change chains of watchtowers and observation posts were built along the Rhine and also along the upper Danube to secure the communication routes between the already existing settlements and forts. Cities that are still important today, such as Strasbourg, Mainz, Bonn or Nijmegen, can be traced back to legionary camps or auxiliary forts from this early period. With the construction of the upper German uh, Ration Lemurs, the Rhine lost its uh, function as a border in uh, Germania Superior for about 115 years. In Germania Inferior, however, the Rhine retained this function continuously for over 400 years, which is uh, a, a great um, difference between these two parts of the Rhine. Uh, here I show you uh, a map of the lower German lemurs which stretched over 400 kilometers from uh, Rhineland Palatinate. Here, the uh, first or last fort, as you uh, can see it, um, is Remagen to the North Sea and formed the border between uh, Germania Inferior and uh, Germania Magna for over 400 years, along, I, I think, around about 450 years. Um, the Middle Rhine Valley 
or an important factor in opening up the Middle Rhine Valley was the development of the, tr uh, the trunk road, the Roman Rhine Valley Road between the state capitals of Mainz and Cologne. Mainz is the, was the capital of uh, Germania Superior, and as we already heard, Cologne was the capital of um, Germania Inferior, um, along the left bank of the Rhine, and both on the high plateaus and in the valley on the left bank of the Rhine. Early forts, for example, in Remagen, Andernach, or Bingen, secured uh, the important trade routes. At the end of the first century AD, the Romans crossed the Rhine and built the 550 kilometers long Upper German region lemurs, which stretched from uh, Rheinbrohl to Eining on the Danube. And um, as you can see, the expansion across the rivers had had uh, strategic reasons on the one hand and economic reasons on the other. With the expansion, um, the Romans incorporated fertile areas as well as mineral resources uh, such as lead or iron ore into their empire. In addition, the ridges of the low, the low mountain ranges on the right bank of the Rhine were included, which enabled better control of these areas. This map uh, shows the different expansion phases of the Upper German Ration Lemurs with, its, uh, with over more than 900 watchtowers and 120 forts and fortlets. So this is uh, the um, Upper German Ration Lemurs between the end of the first century AD and um, the middle of the third century. And the early fortifications along the Rhine are shown uh, in yellow. For example, you have the uh, legionary fortress of Strasbourg, the legionary fortress of Mainz. You have uh, small forts along the Rhine here in um, Augusta Raurica, uh, Speyer, uh, and to, uh, up to, to Andernach and uh, Bonn. Um, at the end of the first century, as I already said, however, this line was abandoned after the Rhine was crossed and the territories on the right uh, side of the Rhine were conquered. So, so and on the, so, sorry. Um, on the territory of uh, today's Rhineland Palatinate, we have a special situation um, at the Finksbach Valley. There is the uh, transition from the lower German lemurs to the upper German ration lemurs. Um, in Roman times, the Finksbach Valley or the Finksbach formed the administrative border between the two provinces of Germania Superior and uh, Germania Inferior. And opposite of the Finksbach, so here you can see the, the border between the two Roman provinces, and opposite of the Finksbach. On the right bank of the Rhine lies the so-called uh, Neuwied Basin, which is um, a very fertile area with uh, agricultural potential. And partly because of the fertile soils in this area, the Romans began their expansion here. Um, and in addition, the easily survey easily or not so easily surveyed lowlands in the direction of the uh, lower <laughs> Rhine. Uh, ends here so that an expansion to the heights seems logical due to uh, the easier surveillance of the of the um, aerial areas um, on the right bank of the Rhine. The um, topographic situation, as I already explained it, um, can be explained well using the example of um, the fort of Remagen, which is located here. Um, Remagen is the first fort on the lower German lemurs coming from the south and the last fort on the lower German lemurs coming from the north. So um, it depends from which direction you, you uh, arrive at Remagen. It was built in uh, Augustan times uh, around about um, the year zero um, plus minus um, five years and existed for over 400 years. So it existed during the entire um, time of the Lower German Lemurs, which is um, very special along, along the Lower German Lemurs. Oh, okay, I'll go back. 
Um, and the fort is situated uh, slightly elevated on a middle terrace of the River Rhine um, on the south bank and offers a good view of the narrow river valley to the north, um, east and south. So as you can see it here. And the digital terrain model also shows once again how deeply the Rhine cuts through the low mountain ranges. So um, different to the, the Rhine in, in, um, in the, the lower Rhine, we, we don't have the space that the Rhine can, can defer its, its course. So it's, it's always the same because you have the high mountains and it's a, it's a really deep valley and you have no, no or the Rhine had, have no space to change its course. So it's, it's always the same till today. Uh, and today, the fort of Remagen is uh, completely built over by the city of Remagen. But um, however, the view from the right bank of the Rhine in the direction of Remagen, as well as to the south, um, in the direction of Fingsbach, it gives an idea of why the Romans decided to cross the river, because you have very limited views um, because of the, the mountains on, on the right bank of the Rhine. Um, the ridges of the Rhenish Massive were very difficult to overlook from the left bank and um, consequently very difficult to protect or it was very hard to, to see uh, people incoming. So, um, so the Romans um, crossed the Rhine to, to uh, protect these areas as well. In the uh, so in the um, between the first century AD and the middle of the third century AD, the the Rhine wasn't a Roman frontier. Um, it was uh, it wasn't a Roman frontier because um, the Romans crossed it, and, and and the Rhine was used as as a trade route. Or, in the third uh, century AD and in the late um, antiquity, antiquity, after the end of the Upper German Ra Ration Lemus, the so-called Lemus Fall, as we already heard by uh, Paul, uh, the Romans retreated to the river borders again and the rivers Rhine, Danube and Illa and um, they built the so-called Danube Illa Rhine Lemus. And in contrast to the upper German Ration Lemus, the Danube Illa Rhine Lemus was designed mainly for defensive purposes. Its forts had uh, much stronger and higher walls than their uh, predecessors of the Middle Imperial period. And in the course of securing the empire's borders under the Roman emperors uh, Constantine and Valentinian in the 4th century AD, New forts were built in Koblenz and Boppard, for example, and already existing forts like the one in uh, Remagen were fortified with strong walls and towers and reinforced and further used. However, um, the right bank of the Rhine was not completely abandoned during this time. Uh, forts in Burgi, for example, in Cologne Deutz or uh, Neuwied Engers were built at irregular intervals to secure the trade route as well as the border army which was stationed on the left bank of the Rhine. Um, the newly built forts uh, such as Boppard, uh, as you can see here in the, in the slide, um, which were now once again located directly on the river, had massive outer walls and outwardly uh, projecting towers for better defense. Uh, here you can see the remains of the Boppard Fort, which is one of the best preserved late antique forts in the uh, Rhineland Palatinate. Uh, see, uh, the height of the walls is uh, impressive. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a good example for the late, uh, late Roman forts along the river. Um, existing forts. Uh, like Remagen were reinforced and further used. As an example, I show you um, a historical uh, photo from the beginning of the 20th century showing the wall remains of the Remagen fort. And a, a further wall 
was built in front of the already existing wall uh, of, the, um, of the middle imperial fort to fortify the defenses. You can see the late antique wall on the um, right edge of the picture. So this is the, this, the, um, the late antique wall, which was built in front of the already existing uh, wall of the, of the earlier fort. So this one. And like in, in Bopard, you have uh, Im impressive height of, of the wall, but um, unfortunately today you can't see it anymore. It's, it's totally destroyed and, and overbuilt uh, by the, the city of Bremagno. Um, these are two more examples of the late antique fortifications that were erected um, for additional border protection on the right bank of the Rhine. Uh, above you see the fort of um, a model of the late Roman uh, fort of Cologne Deutz um, on the opposite of the uh, of the dome today. So, and um, below you can see the attempted reconstruction of the Burgos of Neuwied Engers, which was one of a few burgi in Rhineland Palatinate uh, or in the Middle Rhine Valley down to um, down to Bingen. So once again, I, I show you the map with the construction phases of the Roman border defenses um, to conclude that the late Roman fortifications are uh, in dark red. As you can see here, 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 Alta Ripa and um, Bopat, which I've already shown you. And um, you can see through the early um, occupation, the Rhine formed a Roman frontier in the Middle Rhine Valley in the, from the end of the first century to the middle of the, um, the first, third century, it lost its role as a Roman frontier and was replaced by the um, upper German Ration Limes because of the, um, of the uh, soil and fertile areas which uh, the Romans wanted to have in their emp uh, empire to use um, the, the treasures and to to use the fertile um, agricultural um, areas to to um, for for their own use, and with the so-called Limes fa uh, fall in two thousand. 50, 2060, um, the Romans went back to the river and used the Rhine as a border again. And so we have the Rhine as a Roman frontier, the end. So at the beginning of the fifth century AD, the fortifications at sites along the Rhine and Danube were renewed for one last time. And in the early 5th century, around about 402, however, most of the Roman troops left and the Rhine border temporarily collapsed. Between 407 and 435, the Burgundians in particular defended the border as federati in Roman service. Around 420, together with regular Western Roman units, they once again controlled the entire length of the Rhine, which is proven by archaeological finds and features, for example, in House Bürgel on the Lower German Limes. And with the end of the Roman Empire at the end of the 5th century, the time of the Rhine as a Roman border finally uh, came to an end. So last but not least, I will show you uh, one last picture of um, the outer wall of Haus Bürgel, uh, which is near Düsseldorf uh, today on the opposite bank of the Rhine. And um, in the outer walls, you uh, can see the original um, late Roman defense wall. And with this, I um, would like to thank you all for your uh, kind attention. Very much, Jenny. So my applause will will substitute, I hope, for, for the applause of our audience virtually. <laughs>